Hey all, Rick Howard here. Check out the new season of CSO Perspectives Public, where we bring you free encore episodes of my premium pro podcast. If you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to CyberWire Pro to hear the latest episodes. It's just $10 a month or $99 for an annual subscription. A small price to pay to make sure you stay aware of everything going on in cybersecurity. Plus, it's ad-free. That means no commercials. And you know me, I hate commercials. Visit thecyberwire.com slash pro to subscribe. That's thecyberwire.com slash pro. This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that leaks the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, powering solutions that proactively protect over 2 billion employees and consumers worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. Palo Alto describes the Black Basta ransomware as a service operation. Okta on Scatterswine, the threat actor that compromised Twilio. Microsoft describes Nobelium's new approach to establishing persistence. Russia's war against Ukraine has induced stresses in the cyber underworld. LastPass discloses a security incident. Josh Ray from Accenture on cybercrime and the cost of living crisis. Our own Dave Bittner sits down with Chris Handman of Terra True to discuss how he works to transform legal teams into advocates and collaborators to ensure that privacy is baked in every step of the way. And CISA adds 10 entries to its known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Trey Hester filling in for Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, August 26, 2022. Researchers at Palo Alto Networks have published a description of the operations of Black Basta, a ransomware as a service operation that emerged in April of this year and has since become one of the more active threats. The report states, quote, Although their RAAS has only been active for the past couple of months, it had compromised at least 75 organizations at the time of this publication. Due to the high-profile nature and steady stream of Black Basta attacks identified globally in 2022, the operators and or affiliates behind the service likely will continue to attack and extort organizations, end quote. Black Basta is a cross-platform double extortion threat. Its criminal users have been active against what Palo Alto characterizes as large organizations. The targets are found across a wide range of sectors, consumer and industrial products, energy, resources and agriculture, manufacturing, utilities, transportation, government agencies, professional services and consulting firms, and realtors. Chatter and underground fora by operators of the ransomware have shown a particular interest in the five eyes, that is, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States. But attacks have been observed in U.S., Germany, Switzerland, Italy, France, and the Netherlands. Group IB called the campaign Octopus, since one of the threat actors' principal goals in compromising Twilio was to obtain credentials for Okta's identity and access management software. Twilio, a widely used provider of programmable communication tools, detected the social engineering campaign on August 7th and provided an update on the 24th. Okta has since described the campaign, and they're tracking the threat actor as Scatter Swine. Okta has seen Scatter Swine before. Quote, Scatter Swine has directly targeted Okta via phishing campaigns on several occasions, but was unable to access accounts due to the strong authentication policies that protect access to our applications. End quote. Using logs provided by Twilio, Okta's security team, quote, established that two categories of Okta-relevant mobile phone numbers and one-time passwords were viewable during the time in which the attacker had access to the Twilio console. A one-time passcode is valid for five minutes, end quote. 
they determined that there had been two categories of threat activity. First, a primary category, those mobile phone numbers the threat actor searched for directly in the Twilio console. In these cases, the threat actor was seeking to expand access using credentials stolen in earlier attacks. A secondary category, mobile phone numbers that can be considered incidental to the specific actions or objectives of the threat actor. That is, these were phone numbers that may have been present in the Twilio portal during the threat actor's limited activity window. Okta's analysis reveals no indication that the threat actor targeted or used such mobile phone numbers. Okta's account includes a lengthy discussion of the attacks, techniques, and procedures Scatterswine used, and these are interesting for what they reveal about the conduct of a social engineering attack, about the way in which intelligent use of fish bait and convincing voice imposter combined with commodity phishing kits to harvest user credentials. They also include advice on how an organization can protect itself. Quote, Use behavior detection to act via setup authentication or alert via system log when a user's sign-in behavior deviates from a previous pattern of activity. This threat actor is almost always attempting to authenticate from a new device and a new IP address that has no previous association with the user. End quote. Microsoft researchers have described how Nobelium, the Russian state threat actor more commonly known as Cozy Bear, that is, the SVR Foreign Intelligence Service, maintains persistence in compromised environments. Nobelium is engaged in cyber espionage, quote, executing multiple campaigns in parallel targeting government organizations, non-governmental organizations, intergovernmental organizations, and think tanks across U.S., Europe, and Central Asia, end quote. It's deploying a new toolkit Microsoft calls Magic Web to maintain persistence in the face of attempts to evict it from compromised networks. Quote, Magic Web is a malicious DLL that allows manipulation of the claims passed in tokens generated by an Activity Directory Federated Services server. It manipulates user authentication certificates used for authentication, not the signing certificates used in attacks like Golden SAML. End quote. Microsoft concludes its advisory with some guidelines for hunting Magic Web infestations and it strongly recommends that organizations accord ADFS servers appropriate protection. Quote, It's critical to treat your ADFS servers as a Tier 0 asset, protecting them with the same protections you would apply to a domain controller or other critical security infrastructure. End quote. An essay in The New Statesman describes the ways in which the special military operation has produced fissures in the criminal precincts of the dark web. The report cites observations by researchers at security firm ZeroFox, whose Adam Dara says that the code of criminality, which is generally governed behavior in Russophone fora, had been stressed to the breaking point by the war. Dara explained, quote, You're not allowed to develop tools or sell embarrassing information that could hurt any nation in the Commonwealth of Independent States, a group made up of former Soviet republics, end quote. The gangs had operated under a modus vivendi, guaranteed by Russian official toleration and protection. But Conti's public declaration for Russia's cause in the early days of the war fractured the consensus under which the criminal gangs had conducted business. Criminals have intensified their activities, and that activity increasingly mirrors the political conflicts in the open, above-ground world. LastPass, whose password manager is widely used by both individuals and organizations, disclosed yesterday that an unauthorized party accessed a portion of the company's development environment. The intruder gained access through a compromised developer account and was able to take portions of source code and some proprietary LastPass technical information. LastPass says its customers' accounts remain secure and that its services are operating normally. The company says it's contained the incident, is working on mitigation, and will keep customers apprised of developments. Proper caution would advise enabling multi-factor authentication on LastPass accounts if you haven't already done so. And finally, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, yesterday added 10 new vulnerabilities to its known exploited vulnerabilities catalog, based on evidence of active exploitation in the wild. U.S. federal civilian executive agencies have until September 15th to search for and remediate this most recent set of vulnerabilities. The prescribed remediation is, as is normally the case, to apply the vendor-supplied updates. And now, a word from our sponsor, Recorded Future. 
Staying one step ahead of the rapidly evolving threat landscape requires a constant flow of daily intelligence. To stay up to date on everything happening in the world of cybersecurity, join over 50,000 other security professionals who subscribe to the Cyber Daily. With daily email updates on the latest cybersecurity news, top threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, suspicious IP addresses, and more, the Cyber Daily is the first thing security professionals check every morning. To learn more and subscribe for free, go to recordedfuture.com slash cyber dash daily. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. When we talk about user privacy, it's fair to say that in a lot of organizations, there is, if not outright hostility, maybe low-level suspicions between the software development team and the folks in legal. Everyone's doing their jobs in good faith, of course, but sometimes they can find themselves at odds. Chris Handman is co-founder and chief operating officer at TerraTrue, an organization that's aiming to foster collaboration between the legal and software development teams to make sure privacy is baked in every step of the way. With the privacy landscape, when you think about where we are today, at least here in the United States, we still are largely governed by a kind of free-for-all. There is, as of today at least, no federal privacy legislation to speak of. There are a handful of state laws that have recently come down the pike, starting first in California and sort of extending eastward into Colorado and Virginia and a few others, about a half dozen states at this point. And all of those states were taking their cues, not from Congress, but from the EU, which famously passed the GDPR in 2018 when it came effective. And what we are really dealing with today is still this privacy revolution that remains in its infancy. Laws still are forming. Privacy, when done properly, is a motivation you know, from companies wanting to do the right thing and understanding the processes, the cultures, the uh, mechanisms and tooling to be able to get privacy right. And the only way you can really think about privacy in this day and age, being able to keep pace with a fast moving iterative life cycle of software development is to, you know, this is the phrase like shift left, right? We, we know about the concept in the security space about shifting left, moving regulation and testing and all sorts of scrutiny further into the ideation and development cycle. And as opposed to this kind of reactive uh, after products go out the door, you know, take a look. And I think privacy has historically occupied this almost rightward tilt on that continuum. It's a very reactive, very siloed type of discipline in the past. And I think what companies have increasingly come to embrace is this notion of shifting privacy left. Some have called it like privacy by design, but I think that has sometimes this like almost academic uh, tone to it. And I think what privacy needs to do and what a lot of companies are starting to recognize is move privacy from this siloed compliance heavy idea into sort of a forward thinking, how can we enhance the products from the get-go? How can privacy be a component of the way we enhance and develop our products. And that shift in thinking has already, I think you see at companies across the board, developed richer, better privacy protective products. And in fact, you kind of see it now manifest in really unique cultural ways. You know, Look at Apple, for example, when they're advertising iPhones, right? They are having national campaigns built around really one value prop, right? This iPhone will protect your privacy. And that is a unique change, and I think the zeitgeist of the way we think about privacy, the way companies develop products. And so as companies look to enhance that privacy posture, to have more agility as new laws come down and have to adapt to new regulatory rules, having privacy built in this proactive shift left mentality is going to be a really important way of guiding those future developments. You know, you're using the term collaboration, which which I like. Um, but I can imagine that there are lots of organizations out there who, from the developer's point of view, they look at the legal team as almost being adversarial. You know, they're they're the one, the, the department of no, throwing up uh, you know roadblocks and speed bumps. How do you execute that culture shift to make it a, a true collaborative effort? It's a great point, and I think one of the fears that 
I think most modern legal teams have is that they're going to be viewed as the place that you know, good ideas go to die. And mm-hmm. it is precisely that concern that I think is one of the biggest impediments to developing the types of privacy programs that are effective and dynamic and sort of well-suited for today's environment. And I think it begins with trust. A legal team, a privacy team that goes into a product team or an engineering team and starts reciting chapter and verse about Article 39 of the GDPR or you know, some obscure subsection of the CPRA is very unlikely to garner the types of trust. You need to speak about privacy in terms of product. And the way privacy can enhance the product, the goodwill, the types of uh, types of proactive approaches to the way we want to think about our consumers that I think product people tend to want to pride themselves on. And it is a matter then of meeting them where they work, right? What, that is both a virtual and a sort of physical manifestation. It's trying to work in the same tools. It's trying to go to those uh, stand-ups, uh, trying to be involved in those specs or confluence docs or wherever they happen to be iterating on these concepts. And then gradually creating that culture that says, hey, my role here isn't to veto. It's not to fly spec what you're doing. It's to really help you understand perhaps unintended or unseen consequences of do, using a type of data. There's a lot of uncertainty around like even what data we are using. It's remarkable when you ta- start talking to some product folks, they may not even appreciate all the types of data that is being collected or may not appreciate that this is data that can actually be repurposed to, to specifically target individuals. And so there's an educational process. And as you begin to talk in those pragmatic terms, I think those teams come to appreciate the value that legal and privacy teams can impart to the way they build their products. But that's really the emphasis is on building products as opposed to checking them off for like uh, uh, going through a, a regulatory box checking exercise. And so it's a matter of tone. It's a matter of culture. It's a matter of emphasis. But I think when you combine those, the privacy teams have a very unique ability to become players in that a development process. And if you can't do that, then the whole concept of shifting left or privacy by design or whatever rubric you want to put this under, it becomes completely illusory. And you really do then default to the old world of just privacy as being this sort of compliance uh, checkbox. That's Chris Handman from TerraTrue. There's a lot more to this conversation. If you want to hear more, head on over to the CyberWire Pro and sign up for Interview Selects, where you'll get access to this and many more extended interviews. And now, a word from our sponsor, Axonius. Too many cybersecurity assets and SaaS apps, not enough visibility. Enter Axonius. The Axonius solution correlates asset data from existing solutions to provide an always up-to-date inventory, uncover gaps, and automate action, giving IT and security teams the confidence to control complexity. Visit axonius.com slash cyberwire to learn more and try it free. That's A-X-O-N-I-U-S dot com slash cyberwire. And we thank Axonius for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Josh Ray. He is the Managing Director and Global Cyber Defense Lead at Accenture. Josh, always great to welcome you back. Dave, thanks so much for having me. You know, uh, we are not in a bubble here in the cybersecurity world, and uh, we're seeing headlines every day about how the price of everything is going up, uh, even extending to the war in Ukraine, about how that can affect the cost of everyday goods. I know this is something that you and your colleagues have been looking into here, the true broad effect of the cost of cybercrime. What can you share with us today? Yeah, Dave, I think, you know, today... Uh, the team and I, and, and I was having a great conversation with a colleague of mine, Paul Mansfield, about this. It's really, you know, along the lines of a public service announcement, right? Um, you know, this this whole confluence of world events, you know, the fallout from the pandemic, the conflict in Ukraine. Um, and people, you know, I think across the board are, are really feeling the squeeze around this cost of living increase and some economic hardships. 
And what we've noticed is, you know, similar to what we saw during the during the pandemic, uh, where we saw a whole new raft of cyber criminals focused on COVID fraud and and really focused on defrauding, you know, governments and organizations and and using those as lures. Now we're seeing that really starting to kind of pivot towards uh, the end consumer. And we really just wanted to make sure that we are helping folks kind of raise their awareness uh, in that regard. What sort of things are you all tracking? Well, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of things like opportunistic criminals have been targeting early providers of, say, like rebates and refunds by distributing phishing campaigns um, that are really designed to, to trick victims into divulging things like, you know, personal and financial information. And while, you know, this is obviously not a new thing and people get targeted by these types of things every day, it's really kind of targeting on the heartstrings or the emotional effects of um, of of the economic hardships and, and kind of the cost of living increases. Uh, so we've seen things like, you know, cheap fuel cards, um, stolen gift cards, loyalty cards, uh, really focused on making sure that, you know, they are, again, focused on that emotional component um, to really kind of elicit the, the quick response, uh, the knee-jerk response from the consumer um, to, to trick them into obviously, you know, giving up their financial information. Yeah, I, and I guess, it, I mean, it's worth pointing out that um, every anyone can fall victim to this. You know, we're, we we all have emotions and it's it's easy for all of us in the, you know, fast-paced world in which we live. Nobody's immune to, to falling for these sorts of scams that uh, can hit you emotionally. And as you say, they do it quickly. That's correct. Yeah. And and I think it's it's kind of a very much of a point in time type of, of thing, right? So, you know, you imagine yourself, you're, you know, trying to make ends meet and you're, you're getting ready to go to the gas pump and, you know, you get targeted by one of these things. Um, you know, of course, you know, you're going to potentially click on the link or try to, you know, find out how you can save a few bucks. Um, and I think it's, you know, really kind of incumbent upon the security community as a whole just to make sure that, you know, people are taking a step back and just being aware that there are criminals out there that are are taking advantage of of uh, folks, um, and we just want to make sure that you know this whole notion of buyer beware, uh, both for businesses and consumers, to really stay vigilant. Yeah, I mean, it's a good reminder that you know those of us who are in this every day to reach out to our friends, our family, our our coworkers, our colleagues, even our kids, and uh, remind them that those folks are out there. No, that's absolutely right, and and we do become. You know, as security professionals, very callous, and I think uh, you know we just accept this kind of as the norm. Um, but you know, I do think we have a responsibility to make sure that you know the broader uh, people that you know we're involved with on a day to day basis are aware of these types of scams, are aware of these types of phishing attacks, and know that uh, you know there's there's bad people out there that are that are trying to take advantage of it. Yeah. All right. Well, good advice as always. Josh Ray, thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Devo, whose cloud-native logging and security analytics platform is built to transform security operations for today and beyond. Visit Devo.com to learn more. That's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Don't forget to check out this weekend's episode of Research Saturday, where our own Dave Bittner sits down with Nick Ascoli from Fortrace to discuss their partnership with Pixum and their team's work on phishing tactics, how a threat actor stole 1 million credentials in four months. That's Research Saturday. Check it out. The Cyberwire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our amazing Cyberwire team is Elliot Peltzman, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Liz Irvin, Rachel Gelfand, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Pearl Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Falecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Ivan, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Trey Hester, filling in for Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week.
Hi, this is Jen Iben. I'm the senior producer and one of the founders here at the CyberWire. I'm really excited to share with you that our Women in Cybersecurity Reception is returning this fall. We started the event back in 2014 to bring women working in the industry together. We all know there's a need to increase diversity in cybersecurity, and we wanted to find some ways to help connect those already in the industry and encourage more women to join our ranks. Is your company also passionate about empowering women to succeed in cybersecurity? I'd invite you to join us as a sponsor. We have limited sponsor spots available. Visit thecyberwire.com slash WCS to find out more. And thanks for listening.